Hi there guys and welcome to today's session of Mindfully Alive, part of the Mindfully Alive retreat. I have the awesome um, and amazing privilege of introducing you to Nancy Rayner. She is, as you can tell by the images behind her actually, an incredibly talented artist. I'm actually loving the, I'm loving the images. I first came across Nancy during somebody else's um, summit, somebody, and I just fell in love with what she was saying and the way that she approaches her art and her creativity. And I thought she was somebody that I really wanted to introduce you guys to, 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 to as part of our, our retreat. So that's why I've invited Nancy to be with us. But Nancy, how would you describe who you are and what you do? Oh, okay. Um, first, I recommend all artists have a standard paragraph to say. <laughs> I need to do that. Um, well, I, I live here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, it's the southwest United States, and uh, it's a beautiful place to be, lots of artists. I uh, do several things. I paint. That's my main uh, way of uh, business and, and my art. And um, I sell through dealers uh, and galleries. And then I also love to teach, just love to teach. I've been teaching for 30 years. My parents were both teachers. Uh, it's very important for me. A lot of people say people teach when they can't paint, but I do not believe that. I, I get a lot from my students, and I think it's all part of my process. And I also wrote books, which I happen to have. This just is coming out next month in March. Um, Create Amazing. It's my fourth book. I'm very excited about it, and I'm excited to hear people's thoughts on it when they when they get it and read it. Um, and I also do videos; it's all part of my teaching. So, uh, and I coach also, you know, from my studio in Santa Fe or Skype. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, just guys, so if you actually hear kind of a very windy environment, we are filming this. I think it's. Is it Hurricane Doris that's attacking the world today? Cause it's very windy here, and by the look of the kind of the movement of the trees outside your studio, you've got a lot of wind as well. It's super windy, like a hurricane wind. Yeah, so you might hear it here too. So yeah, so if you guys hear kind of funny noises going around today, it's because it's nice and windy at both ends. Okay. So okay, this is where we say pull up um, a chair and, and grab a drink. So today my little um, it's my hedgehog I've got with me today again, and I actually my notes are going to be. Well, I say I'm writing notes. My little notebook and my is is here. So, what we're going to do is get you to start off by, as, as usual, by taking three deep breaths so that we are centered and ready to listen to in to what Nancy has got for us. So, let's take a deep breath in and breathe out all of the worries and the stress of today. And breathe in and breathe out all of the worries that we have about the future of how things might be, should be, ought to be. And breathe in. And breathe out all of the worries of the past, all of the ruminations of things, of how things should have been and haven't been. And let's bring ourselves back to this moment in time so that we're here to focus in on what Nancy has to say for us. Thank you. So, we were talking, when we, when we were kind of preparing for the interview, we were talking about the idea of creative block and just how it's actually part of being, a natural part of being a creative and being an artist. So, I'm guessing that you experience creative block. Sure. I think everybody has creative blocks. We are creative beings, whether we're artists or how, you know, women who are raising a family, I mean, everything in between. Uh, so in that, as creative beings, we have a natural cycle and of productivity and non-productivity. And I think that often, and creative blocks fall into that non-productivity area. But I think that all artists are part of an ebb and flow and have those downtimes. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, just thinking about how has that creative block affected your kind of your career as an artist? Hmm, that's an interesting point. Um, because uh, I I do want we had talked about this. I do want to get into sort of my definition of creative blocks and how to get out of it. But I think that um, it's a good idea to talk about the career because you could be making art and 
not want to make money out of it, not want a career out of it. But there are many people who say, hey, I've been painting for a while. I would like to make some money out of it. It's very fulfilling to have other people want to buy your work or um, depend. I talk as a painter, so I know there's a lot of different a variety of artists out there. But um, I think that when you feel that you have control over your process, when you know that if you go to a gallery and you say, hey, um, do you, are you interested in my work? And they say, sure, we'll take eight. And you go, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do that. Um, a part of that is being able to handle creative blocks. Like I said, it, ebb and flow, we just have those productivity periods and non-productivity. And, and sometimes we might think if we don't realize it's a natural part of the creative process, we might think, oh, I'm not a good artist. I can't be... I can't make a career out of this yet, uh, but it is a natural part. And once you have some tools to get through it, you know, if you have a show in in three months and you have to get ten paintings done, you don't have time to wallow around in a creative block. And so it does give a sense of empowerment to be able to deal with your issues. It's part of issues. Mm. So how would you describe creative block then? Oh, yeah. Um, I think a simple definition is uh, an inability to take action. You know, you wake up and you say, I don't want to go into my studio. I don't want to do anything. I don't feel motivated. I don't feel inspired. You know, and, and you feel bad. You know, a lot of bad feelings about it. But a creative block is really part of an inability to take action. And so I do I think... think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So I was going to say, so in some ways it's a bit like procrastination. Or, is it, or would you say it's different? Um, I think, uh, I well, let me start with this. Um, if we look at, there's really two types of creative blocks. Okay. The, the, there's the ones that are uh, healthy, I guess, <laughs> not healthy, but the ones that are positive, and then there's the ones that are negative. And procrastination would fall into that negative category of creative block that's keeping you from working when you really are in the mode to work. Um, but if we look at just, you know, nature, all of nature has ebb and flow. I mentioned this before, you know, tides, seasons, we have day and night, we need to sleep. Um, think about what it would be like if we felt that we, that it was wrong to go to sleep. We should be active all the time. But that's sometimes what we put on ourselves as artists. We say, hey, I'm productive this whole month. I made a whole lot of paintings and now I'm not productive. What's wrong with me? And what we need to see is that it's a natural part of the creative process because we are evolving beings so that we want to change our ideas, we need to change our mediums, we need to change things. And so we're, I see it as like a, a mountain, okay? So you at the beginning of the mountain climb, uh, you, you have an idea and you get all inspired. And then you work on that idea till you get to the top of the mountain. Now, when you're at the top of the mountain, you're high productivity. Your idea is in full bloom. You're on a roll. You're at the top of the mountain. You feel great. And you feel like, I am a good artist. I could do this. And you're making paintings that all of a sudden they're just finishing. Now you start to go down the mountain. And everyone does that. Every project does that. Every idea does that. Otherwise, we get stuck. We're stagnant. So it's a good thing. So when you start to feel like you are we're running out of ideas, not so excited about going to the studio, the paintings are taking longer to finish. Instead of thinking, oh no, what's wrong with me? I need to force myself to get back in that studio. I need to crack the whip. Um, instead say, oh, I'm starting to go down the other side of the mountain towards my next idea. And instead of rushing to that next idea, oh, I better get a next idea to get on this high again, <laughs> I recommend just acknowledging or being conscious of, uh, mindfully aware, as your retreat is called, um, that you're heading down to a place where it's a good hibernation place. It's a good place to really be in that relaxed, non-action place. And so, just like in meditation, I, t I take a yoga, Bikram's yoga I like, they have these poses and in between every pose is a non-pose or they call it a pose of no action and I really like that because of what I'm talking about but I like 
not moving, not thinking, just total stillness. Because then when you come out of it, you're energized. And so you have to realize that if you don't allow this time of stillness, you're not going to have that energized action to go up the next mountain. And so um, how the, 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 I, the question comes, how do we know when we're going down that side of the mountain and we just need to rest, and that could be a week vacation, it could be a month of just writing or relaxing or going on a trip, doing non-art things, uh, reading books, anything that, that makes you feel like you're relaxed <laughs> and not feeling guilty about not being productive. Um, how do you know when you're in that moment versus, uh, and I want to get into this, the left versus a problem versus an issue where you're stuck. You're now, I have a little experiment I recommend, which is um, that if you're not sure, but you realize that you're just not working, you feel like you're not productive, take one or three days and just don't go to the studio at all. Then at the end of the, that period, go back for 30 minutes and do something. After that 30 minutes, if you feel energized, then you need to stay in your studio and keep working. If you feel exhausted, then you're in that valley where your body needs to not be forced to work. So you need to understand where you're at with that inaction. And so if we talk about inaction, really there's, um, there's I believe that inaction, and I read this in a psychology book actually, that when you have two thoughts that about the same topic that contradict each other, your brain stops action. And that made me think a lot. I've been thinking about that a lot when I have my downtimes because two opposing thoughts. So that could be, and usually I think one of the thoughts is conscious thought and the other is an unconscious thought. So sometimes the, the conscious thought could be, I want to go to my studio and paint. But the unconscious thought is, you are being too self-serving. And I'm using that because my parents always said, you need to be, how can you paint for yourself? You need to be a serving. They're very into serving. Um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes we have these unconscious thoughts that come up and they, they counteract each other. So the body and the brain just stop. And I think that this is really the key to a creative block, is being able to um, hear both voices. And a lot of times, they're an, we could call them an inner voice and an outer voice. We could call them a left brain command and a right brain desire. And, I, and I, let's talk, I find that the most interesting, so let's talk about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on a roll, is this okay? <laughs> That's absolutely fine, go for it. All right, just cut in whenever you want. Um, so the, the left brain is our control command and the right brain is our creative side. A lot of us know that, but let, let's look at it a little deeper. The left brain uses words and it comes from almost like dinosaur age. It's like our prehistoric place where it's protecting us. And it, the left brain is a, our good guy, actually. Um, it, it, wants, it does not want us to go get distracted because a dinosaur might eat us or a boulder will fall on us. I mean, it, it goes back to those primitive ideas. So the left brain is constantly trying to keep us from going deeper. And when you're working on your creative work, you need to go deeper. Uh, the right brain is totally happy doing, you know, in the zone, lost in the zone. It, um, it's timeless, wordless. It's when you're working it air and all of a sudden the time goes, you go, oh, that felt so great. You know, that's working in the right brain. And a lot of people say, hey, you need to make your art in right brain. But our right and left brains, our right and left brain halves, um, they're there all the time and they work together, actually. Um, so what I say is that there's one brain dominant at the time. Not, they're not both dominant at the same time. The left brain starts everything. The left brain is the controller. It likes to start everything. And I, I like to think, I don't know if I should say this, but I like to think of the left and right brain as being the stereotypical 50s couple. 
you know, where the guy always drives, the woman sits in the seat. Again, this is stereotypical old, right, we hope. Um, but the, the left brain, the driver, it'll start every task. It starts when we sit down to paint, we are in left brain. And the left brain has to decide that it is not good for this job to give it over to the right brain. So there's this shift in the very beginning of working on, a, on, a, on your artwork where the left brain shifts. And when it shifts, it doesn't like to shift because it feels, hey, I'm not going to be in control. If that right side goes to town and starts to paint, something might happen. You know, this is a dangerous position to be in. So our left brain, and I think it's, a, it's good to understand the left and right brain because this is really where a lot of the frustration and creative blocks and procrastination, as you had said, you know, come up into play is that the left brain is trying to keep us from going deeper and the right brain wants us to go deeper. So here's the two opposing um, thoughts. Now, uh, when you're a new artist, this shift from left to right brain that always happens in the beginning, start painting and the, fir the first thing the left brain might say is, hey, you're wasting paint. This costs a lot of money. <laughs> It'll use any argument, it's very creative actually, use any argument to keep you from going deeper into your work. And you can start a dialogue. You can say, left brain, thank you for protecting me, but I would like to paint and I'm in a safe situation here, so you just go take a back seat and let me paint. Now the left brain is gonna keep coming and checking in. So this left-right shift happens a lot. And if you're not aware of it, and um, the more experience you have as, a, as an artist, the, the left brain gives up because it says, all right, I've tried all my tricks. You're, you're, you're going to keep painting, so I'll just check in and say hi and back off. But in the beginning, an, a beginning artist might actually stop, keep stopping as they're working. It's very hard on us and our creative process. Uh, so it's nice to kind of pay attention to the dialogue that's going on. What is that left brain saying? And, and not letting the right brain do its thing, which is our expressive self. So, or you could say the adult, the parent and the child. You know? So um, I think that the, we, it's good to just pay attention to that and know what your tricks are. And the more that you don't uh, follow those directives from the left brain, the more you say, you know, like the left brain could say, aren't you hungry? Don't you need to do the laundry? <laughs> you know, it'll do anything. You say, no, no, uh, and it, give me an hour and I'll check in with you. <laughs> okay. Um, and, I, and I think that's really important because actually a lot of where we feel stressed and overwhelmed is when our left brain is spinning off and kind of worrying about the future, ruminating on the past. That's all left brain stuff, isn't it? And kind of where it's looking a lot of... Oh, sorry, you brought up something really interesting, which is that the left brain does think of the past and the future. This is good. I, I didn't think of this till now, but thank you for saying that. The right brain is in the present moment. That's where our best creativity. And so I cut you off. I'm sorry, because I'm so excited. <laughs> what were you saying? <laughs> no, it's, it's exactly the same idea, actually, that it's because our left brain is so, so desperate to keep us safe. It's thinking about the past and the future. And um, for me, Mindfully Alive is actually about somehow getting that right, right side of our brain to be working. I'm waving my left hand. <laughs> Sorry, that's the that's getting right. Screen, yeah. Uh, so, but, so mindfully, like for me, my, being mindful is when the right side of the brain is active, is working, is when we are feeling safe enough to let that take over. And I'm fascinated that you're kind of talking about that in terms of creating your art as well. It's amazing. Well, uh, it's being in the moment. No, this is great. Thanks for that. Being in the moment is where we want to be when we're creating our art. And there was a, there's a book that is pretty well known called uh, The Natural Way to Draw. If you've taken, if you've gone to art school, I don't know if they still use it, but Nicolades is the author. And in there, he says uh, that if you are creating art in your right brain, you cannot make a mistake. You can't make a mistake. It just comes from an inner source. And really that's what making art is about, is about sharing our common desire as human beings as kind of an inner spirituality or inner source or a message. It could be an emotional message or 
our political message too, but uh, there's lots of, lots of reasons to do our creativity. But I think that um, knowing that the left and right brain constantly go back and forth and that the left will try to pull us out and the right is really where we feel fulfilled and productive and creative. And that it's okay to go back and forth. That's really our work. It's, it's not really, the work isn't really the making of the thing. The work is how to deal with our left and right going back and forth so that most of the time we're in the right brain, acknowledging the left when it needs attention <laughs> and, and um, allowing ourselves to continue and go deeper. Now, when we're working, we go in levels of, of deeper. And as we go deeper in the work, the left brain goes right in there because deeper is dangerous for the left brain. So every time that left brain says, again, you know, do you want to do your laundry or maybe it's time to take a break or we've been using too much pain, it's expensive, all of those excuses that keep us from painting. Uh, when it says that, um, oops, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, oh yeah, when it says that, that's a good time to notice and say, you know, I may be going deeper. I may be on the brink of something very interesting. So you tell the left brain, you know, hi, I'm going to check this out. And then we go deeper. And that's really how we get better and better as artists is having the ability to, to maintain the right brain longer and longer periods. Uh, so I actually, and then I think uh, we had talked about, um, I have five favorite uh get yourself out of the creative block methods. So I'll go into that unless, do you have some other questions? No, go for it. I think that's probably what people are going to really benefit from hearing as well, because we've talked a bit about the theory of it. So let's have some practical techniques of what to do about it. Okay, um, my first is, is well, I like all of them. They're all my favorites. I was going to say it's my favorite, but they all are. This first one is interesting uh, for painters, but anybody in any discipline can, can try it out. Um, I call it tap into first thoughts. So it really is, if, if you think about um, the inner child has a thought, oh, I want to paint, I want to um, splash orange all over this canvas, I, you know, it's usually a childlike uh, uh, idea or an excited idea. The second thought is the parent thought to keep us from that usually saying, mm, orange is expensive, why don't you paint a nice green landscape, you can sell it better, you know, or something like that. We have been trained in our cultures to listen to that second voice instead of the first one. And this might be a good um, solution if your creative block is, in fact, two contradictory thoughts on the same topic at the same time, or the left, right, it could be that left, right brain, is that how to get in touch with that inner voice again. Because the inner voice is always right. That's what we want to do. The second voice is the shoulds, the parent, the, you know, the, the, the correct thing that you're supposed to do. And it never is sat as satisfying as going with that first thought. So here's what I recommend is decide that for 10 days in a row, you're going to dedicate a tw tw the first 20 minutes before you work as a warm-up. And so before you start your first day, get prepared. Get 10 cheap, inexpensive surfaces like take newsprint and gesso it or pieces of cardboard, something that you can paint on and have them all ready and then get your whole setup ready. So when you walk into your studio or wherever you're working, there it is. And you, you can set a timer for 20 minutes. It's only 20 minute exercise. And, um, and I think the results can be very satisfying. So, okay, the first thing you do is you go up to that surface that's already on the wall, hang it, have everything ready and try to, and ask yourself, what do I want to do? And then pay close attention to that quiet inner voice. And if you haven't been paying attention to it, it's going to be pretty quiet, almost silent sometimes. You might not even hear anything and <laughs> say, oh, I don't know, just do something. But just let's say the first voice says, I, I just want to cover it with any color at all. It could be something simple like that. Now, what you don't want to do is preconceive what you're going to paint. I'm going to paint a landscape. No, that's not, that's, that's too big. <laughs> it needs to be one thought. So your first thought, your first action. So whatever it is, do it. 
and it could sound really silly, <laughs> it may, because it's testing you, uh, do it anyway. And then look at what you did, and instead of analyzing it, because it's not about a, making a painting, it's not a critique, just look at it and say, now I want to what? And keep doing that, and then respond by taking action immediately, and start to, in that 20 minutes, doesn't matter what you paint, what you do, all that matters is that you try to catch what that first voice is saying and notice what the second one is saying. And it is fascinating because I think that um, we, our beings, aren't the left brain or the right brain. We don't have to uh, label ourselves as one or the other, and we're not both. We're actually something else, and the brain is just a tool. And so if you are listening to the first voice, and the second, then who are you? You are the this spiritual entity. And so it, it becomes very powerful, I think. Now at the end of the 20 minutes, you just take it, you can throw it away, or you can just stack it, but you don't want to look at it. You don't want to have it out to affect your regular studio work. And you just repeat this every morning and see what happens. And after 10 days, uh, I said morning, but at the beginning of whenever you're painting, some people paint at night. Um, I think that it really gets you hearing loud and clear that inner voice. It also allows that inner voice, which has been silenced, potentially silenced, if you are in a creative block, that's usually what is happening is that you are not allowing yourself to take action on what you want to take action on. So this is, well, what do I want to take action on? And again, it'll be funny and silly at first, but then all of a sudden it'll start to get more of who you are and what you really want to do and less paying attention to that second voice and the second voice may actually disappear or become more silent and not interfere so much uh, with your creative process so I like that and the key is I had a student who I gave this assignment to I mean it would have been perfect for her uh, it was perfect for her actually but she had a lot of trouble not pre-planning what the idea was going to be so she emailed me back and she said well I set up just like you did and I feel miserable because I got there and I just stood there and stared at it and I said well first of all you did take action you started the exercise you showed up that's big I said but you're staring at it because you think you need to to come up in your brain with a preconceived idea and that's not what this exercise is about it's about avoiding over analyzing and over preparing and over it's about again touching uh, touching base with that first spontaneous inner voice so anyway then eventually uh, she was able to do it and, and it really made a difference so don't get frustrated if your first couple of days you're just standing there um, you pretty much if you're doing that then you have lost touch with your inner voice and our inner voice is the most important thing I think uh, that we can uh, be in communication with while we're in our creative process Okay, so the, so the second thing, if you're in a creative block, uh, and again, the creative block is inability to take action when you really feel like you want to take action rather than uh, you have just finished, uh, let, let's say you've just finished a show. I, I call it post-project departum. <laughs> you know, you just finished a big show or a series or some big event. You're not gonna wanna paint right away. You're gonna be in that valley. Again, that's not what I call creative block. That's called a rest period and a rejuvenated a rejuvenation uh, necessi necessity. <laughs> okay, so again, here's my second idea for creative block. And that is, you know, therapy is, is good for some people and some people not. Um, there are creative coaches who specialize in therapy for the creative process and they're and you're also life life is busy life gets in the way it could be something that has nothing to do with your creativity but it you know um, life changes things that are happening in your life that are keeping you from being creative being creative takes a lot of energy so you might be just tired and need um, a regular therapist to get through some of the stuff that's stuff management I call it stuff that's happening in your life to free yourself up for your creativity but I, and so I think the therapy is really great and, and creative coaches are uh, wonderful new 
phenomenon that I think is good. Um, but here are, here's one way that I, it's a do-it-yourself therapy, DIY, what did I say, DIY therapy. Um, so, because we have our own left and right brain, um, we can actually uh, do this ourselves. So, uh, take 15, 10, 15 minutes of quiet time where you're not going to be distracted. Turn your phones off, your computer off, and get two chairs, put it in a room five feet apart, facing each other. And you sit in the first chair, and that is the uh, counselor chair. That's the therapist chair. That's the left brain chair. And ask the first question that comes in your mind. It could be, um, why are you here? It could be, uh, you know, what's, how are you feeling? What's wrong? Uh, anything. Just whatever pops in your mind. Again, the spontaneous is really worth it. Then you get up and you move to the other chair. <laughs> and that is the right brain chair or the, uh, the um, what do you, counselor and patient? Is it a patient or counselor and person? Clients? I don't know. <laughs> You're the answerer. You're the recipient. And you answer. <laughs> and then... You go back to the other chair and you ask another question and you go, and so you have this dialogue going back and forth with the chairs. It's funny when my son was younger and he was uh, having a, a rough time with something and I told him this was a, one of my favorite. He looked at me and he said, "You don't really do this, do you, Mom?" And I said, "Yeah, I do." You know, <laughs> I mean, it can feel really silly going from chair to chair, but what's really interesting is the response when you go back and forth. Your brain actually switches left, right, left, right. And you're actually answering with your right brain. And the most amazing things sometimes come out. Now, I also found another uh, way to do this if you're in a place where you don't want someone to hear you, because <laughs> that's, you know, you're expressing yourself verbally. You could do it with a pencil and pen and switch hands. So get a big piece of paper. You need big because our non I'm right handed. So that's my dominant hand, and then this is my non-dominant hand, set my left. My left, when I write, it's all scrawly and scribbly, and it needs a lot of space. It can't work in lines. But your dominant hand would be the counselor or the left brain, like the first chair, and your other hand is the right brain or the, the person you know that's answering. And you take a pencil, and you just write the question with your main hand. Then you switch hands, and you write the answer with your non-dominant hand. Now, you will not be able to read what your non-dominant hand writes. Some of you might be ambidextrous, is that what they call it? But um, I can't understand. Mine just looks like a, like a wavy scribble. But I can hear what I'm writing. I know what I'm writing. And so the question and answer can happen with changing hands, and it can be more quiet if you need a quieter approach. So that's my second um, way of getting out of creative blocks is just therapy and you can use a therapist or do it yourself so and then my third method um is should i keep going or do keep, you going. Wanna, no, keep going my third method is um i keep wanting to say one of my favorite they're all here <laughs> is positive thinking i really think that positive thinking is is key to everything not just in my creative work but when I decided I wanted to make a business or a career out of my art I had to think positive with that too in other words um, I thought I need to call a gallery I need to call a gallery I'm feeling nervous well I'm not gonna lift that phone up if I feel that way I'm going to sit and either meditate or get a brush and, and fling it around and say I'm a great artist even if I don't believe it I have to say something really positive then I get on the phone you know, so the same thing with my artwork is that I, I like my paintings to have a positive impact. Not everybody has the same goal for their, their artwork, but I cannot create something that has a positive impact if I am not feeling positive. I have to, again, meditate or talk myself out of negative thought. Um, I, it, this has been many years of working on positive thinking, and it started with a Abraham Hicks material. There's a woman, Esther Hicks. I think she was just finally on Oprah. I don't know why it took so long, but she's really phenomenal. And her material, is, there's a lot of free material out there, and she wrote a lot of books. And um, and her big thing is, is positive thinking. And the first thing she said was, uh, take in one day, find five times where you have a negative thought. 
and at the and stop yourself and say this is a negative thought say the negative thought and then change that sentence to a positive one and it was very fascinating the first time i did it i thought I, I realized i had negative thoughts all the time i went oh my you know that's called the monkey mind i guess in in uh eastern religions they call it the monkey mind when you're all left brain or you're all uh letting your brain run everything and um so I thought, wow, I have a lot of work to do. But, you know, just starting, uh, then I started noticing every negative thought. So, like, a negative thought could be, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I need more technique. I'm not good enough. I, you know, I really believe we have everything we need to do what we want to do at that moment. Um, it's amazing how many, we're just trained. Our society, if you're around friends and you have something negative to say, you get everyone's attention. And when you have something positive to say, you get a lot of jealousy. It's interesting that the more positive I became, and it, it got to a point where I could not say a negative sentence. I mean, it's still hard for me on this video to come up with one, but I could not say it. And then I couldn't, it hurt me to hear my friends and other people saying negative thoughts. Uh, so I actually, a lot of friends came left <laughs> and I had new friends. It really was a big shift. The positive thinking, it just changes everything. Um, but it's also so empowering um, to be able to, at any moment, feel bad and say, what is the negative thought that's making me feel bad? And I'm going to change that. And so whatever negative thought you have, again, it could be, <laughs> it's hard for me to come up with one. Uh, um, I don't have enough material. I don't have enough money to be a painter. Uh, then you say, I have everything I need to be the best painter I can be. You know, it can be something very simple to shift it. And then you stop your brain from creating those negative thoughts because it's, it's out of control. You know, so positive thinking is great. The other book that I really liked was called The Answer, written by John Asaroff. And he talks a lot about making vision boards to help um, your positive thinking. All right, so that's three things. Uh, the fourth was really very simple. Um, just take a break, make yourself take breaks, and enjoy it. And I talked about this in the beginning when you have those hill places. Allow yourself to be in action and enjoy it. Because if you're in, in if you're in that non-action place and you're worried all the time, you feel guilty. You're not really getting that true rest. So the fourth and the last one. <laughs> Last one is avoid perfectionism. So um, what's funny is that my new book is called Create Perfect Paintings. And I, I felt funny about the word perfect, but I was like, no, I, I believe in um, reaching for our own individual perfection with our work, but knowing when to stop and not trying to create a, a work that is someone else's ideal of perfection. You know, constantly saying, what do I feel would really make it for this piece? You know, and then let it go and move on. So there's that balance of working until it's really as good as you can get it. That's perfect. And then, and then move on uh, to, to your next thing. And I just wanted to share a story that when I first started painting, I mean, I went to art school, I had my bachelor's and I had my master's degree. Um, but then I said, all right, now I'm really going to paint. That was very scary. I'm going to get a studio. And and I think in that last video that where you found me, Julie, is what I was talking about, you having your own space for studio. And I got this big canvas, and I started painting on it. And a year later, the painting was finished. And I sat there and I said, you know, every idea you had went into this painting. You could have made 10 separate paintings. But I kept, as my ideas changed, I just kept on the same painting. So it got this kind of a, a te one teacher told me she, my paintings had a crusty surface because I kept overworking them. Um, because of this perfection idea, I just kept, I didn't realize that each idea had its moment where it was allowed to leave and then you need to start a new canvas for your next painting. So avoiding perfectionism can allow you to keep moving forward. It can allow you to, um, feel what's the word uh whenever you accomplish something to take a moment and appreciate appreciation 
is is key. So do something, do it the best you can, and then instead of saying, oh, it's terrible, I could have done better, just say, I did the best I can. I really appreciate that I just did this and I finished something. And now I'm going to move on. It's almost like the, the mountain thing again. Each piece we do, everything we create, is part of this ebb and flow. And we need to keep moving rather than getting stuck on the top of the mountain with this, you know, same canvas. So, so there you go. Those are my five uh, ways that I get out of creative blocks. And do you have any questions on anything? No, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, that's a huge amount of a, a huge amount of information to take in. But there's a steady theme running through it, which is about kind of that left and right brain that actually. Our left brain, which is so conscious of trying to keep us safe, is it's all shouting at us all the time and we need to get into the right brain. And all the techniques that you've talked about are about combating that right that left brain that's kind of shouting at us to kind of to do things, but they're kind of coming at it from different angles. And I know certainly know having taught stress control for sort of the twenty odd years, that actually some techniques work at certain times and they don't work at other times. And it's just really refreshing to hear that if, for you within your art you actually use different techniques at different times and that that they work differently at different times which is fab oh that's so good you brought that up because um, as creative beings uh, every creative block puts us in a different place and needs a different solution to get out of it so if we look at every negative you know solution issue like I am not working and I feel like I'm in a creative block well what is our our creative way of getting out of it and the creative way of getting out of it uh, so you could do my five but you can also revamp them and come up with your own um, when you when you do that it actually feeds your artwork they're all related so there's no bad you know the creative block is is just realizing you're not letting yourself do what you want to do and then when you're released you're even better so without that creative block, you would never even get to that point where you need to reevaluate you know, what you want to do. And so, yeah, every creative block that you come up with that works at one time may not work the next time, or you have to rotate them. And, you know. Well, wow, well, I'm just aware that we have covered a huge amount of bounds. So my question to you is, you obviously do a lot of things. You paint and you coach and you've got all sorts of things going on for you. So how can people connect with you after the event? I understand you've got something for, a way for people to connect with you. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I have a website and it's my name.com, nancyrainer.com. And on my website, if you, I think you were going to put a link. There's it's just a, below the screen just here. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, there's a coaching section. And under coaching, there's a sub menu and it says free videos. And under free videos, I have several videos, the interviews, uh, I'll put this interview on there, and uh, different techniques that are fun. And also, I have a blog on a separate uh, link that has all the articles, and some of them are technical and some of them are emotional, you know, about this kind of thing, uh, psychological. And uh, yeah, and then I also. Um, coach and teach and and then there's my shameless plug my new book which actually lists all of these um, there's a whole chapter on free the creative block in here and also a whole section on left right brain so everything I said is actually in this book so um, thanks for letting me plug it but <laughs> that's okay that's not a problem oh wow I'm sitting here thinking we could probably I could sit and listen to you for for ages, but I'm aware that we've come to the natural ending of, of our time together. And I want to say a huge thank you to you, Nancy. It, I've definitely got some things to go away and think about and put into practice, so thank you. Well, thanks for including me in your Mindfully Aware Retreat, because I, I just feel like it's an honor to be part of that. A lot of my work is really connected to more of a, a spiritual part of ourselves as human beings, creative human beings. and. Thank you, and I know I'm in the presence of lots and lots of great thinkers and, and artists, so thank you. So this is where we say goodbye to Nancy, thank you, and thank you guys for sitting here and being with us, and I know that there's some huge things that you can take away, even if you just try one of these things, they have the power to, to get you out of those stuck places, and if nothing else, knowing that you're 
left brain is trying to keep you safe so that you don't have to fight that kind of and um, kind of think why am i why am i going mad why is this boy shouting at me and all if all you've taken from away from today is that actually it's trying to keep you safe and that's a good thing then you've gained something amazing so thank you guys thank you for listening and i will catch up with you in our next session take care and bye then